afterlife. I went to high school with, with Richard, and that's how I know we've been close friends ever since. Um, I read this book, and it was great. And I love to read about things that have more to do with stuff other than what we know right here. And um, Karen, could you speak up a little yeah, bit? Yes, sorry. Reading this book, there were places in it where it just kind of like opened my mind, you know, and I believed anyway. I believed before I, I you know, read this and I knew what he was doing. Um, but that's this book. But let me tell you about him. He's a filmmaker. That's the main thing that he does. He's made four feature films. Well, I'll just talk to you about the nature of this research and how I came to it. Basically, um, how many of you here have heard about past life regressions? Everyone's heard about that. Has anyone tried it or had one? Okay. Okay, very good. Brian Weiss, you know, is the, the famous Yale psychiatrist who uh, came upon this work and, and started to sort of really um, use hypnotherapy to uh, help people with psychosomatic illnesses. In my case, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and I was in Tibet uh, making a film with Robert Thurman, uh, Oma Thurman's dad. And uh, partially because of events that had happened to me prior to my becoming interested in this material. And basically, by 1996, um, my girlfriend and closest pal on the planet uh, passed away from breast cancer. And we were very close, but as she was dying, she said to me, I think I'm going to another galaxy. And I said, what? Why did you say that? She says, I had this recurring dream that I'm in another galaxy. I'm in a classroom. Everyone's dressed in white. And they're teaching a class in spirituality. She said, I, I don't, it's a language I've never heard before, but I completely understand it when I'm in this vision. And I thought, oh, okay, that's the morphine talking. It's got to be. But then the day she died, her close friend called from Hawaii and said, oh, I had the most amazing uh, vision about Luana. Luana was her name, Luana Andrews, an actress, many years. Um, that she was in the fourth dimension, she said, in a classroom, and everyone was dressed in white. I thought, well, that's unusual. And so I mentioned it to the nurse who had been taking care of her, and the nurse nearly fainted. She said, well, that was her recurring dream that she had, that she was in this classroom. And I thought, I don't think I can get into that class where I'm at spiritually. Luana had been a Buddhist for many years, and so I thought, well, maybe, maybe Buddhism would be a way mm -hmm. to figure out how to get into those classrooms, whatever that means. So I got a job. Charles Broden was her friend um, and mutual friend, and he invited me to come and work on his talk show in New York City. So while I was in New York, I met Robert Thurman. Um, does anybody ever heard of him? He's written a number yes. of books about... The, Tibetan Buddhism is kind of the foremost authority in America on the topic. Yes. I thought, wow, what an opportunity. So I asked if I could audit his class. And I'd sit in this classroom um, at Columbia University, and it was like he was speaking another language, because it was so over my head. It was a doctoral class uh, in philosophy. So I thought, well, you know what? It's a language I'd like to learn. So I spent the next 10 years sort of figuring out what that was about, studying Tibetan Buddhism. And somewhere in that process, I was in my apartment in uh, the Upper West Side. And has anybody ever had an out-of-body experience? Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, some of us have had. And sometimes it just feels like you're floating above your body, and and uh, sometimes it happens when you're, you know, in, in a doctor's office. You know, there's cases of that. Quite a few. Before um, surgery. So, and you're wondering like, what's going on, and then you're suddenly in your body. Like, what is that? Robert Monroe has written a number of books about the topic. Um, but I was curious as well. And anyway, so I was in my apartment in New York, and suddenly I had an out-of-body experience. I had been wondering, I wonder where Luana is a year after her death. You know, if you go somewhere, where do you go? And I suddenly felt myself shoot out of my body, and I saw New York disappear below me, the way like there was a film called Powers of Ten, where you see the Earth go be, you know, below. And I was shooting into outer space as fast, so fast, like a neutrino, apparently, because light was sort of melting around me. 
And then I found myself going through some kind of a wormhole. I, that's all I can say. It was just like bouncing around. And then I felt myself on, in another place, another galaxy, I guess, but moving sideways now instead of going forward. And when I stopped, she was standing there with her eyes closed. She opened them and looked at me. And I thought, oh, this is really bizarre. And as I thought that, somebody honked a horn outside my window. Truck horn. But the weird thing was, before the guy finished the honk, I traveled backwards. Back, you know, almost like a string, pulling me like a rubber band, and into my body. And when I woke up, I was startled, needless to say, like, what the heck was that? And so you normally, when you have an out-of-body experience, you just chalk it up to something odd. But in my case, I went, it either happened or it didn't. If it didn't happen, then it's not worth examining. If it did happen, then what is the mechanics? And can I go visit her on my own? If she exists in this other galaxy, let's say, is there a way to find her? So I was, I won't go into the long, you know, I'll go to the short of it. I, during the course of my research, I discovered um, this author named Michael Newton. He's a doctor, hypnotherapist, practiced in Los Angeles from the 50s on. Like Brian Weiss, he had a very similar experience where a patient had come to him with a psychosomatic illness, a pain that no one could figure out what it was. Under hypnosis, he said, take me to the source of your pain. And now, I must add, Michael was a skeptic, didn't believe in past life regression. Uh, it was right around the time of Bridie Murphy. You know that case where a woman remembered being from Ireland and many books were written about it. Mm -hmm. So he didn't believe it. He thought it was nonsense. But this guy on his, you know, on his couch suddenly remembered, went quickly into uh, being stabbed in a trench in World War I. And Michael Newton, being the skeptic, said, oh really? Well, what's your name? What's your rank? What's your mother's maiden name? What street did you grow up on? And as Michael says, and I, I there's a, the, at the Amazon.com webpage for the book, there's a, a link to about a 10 minute clip from the documentary that, I was, that I've been shooting, where he recounts the story. But anyway, so Michael, unbeknownst to the patient, contacted the British War Office and asked them if there was such and such guy in such and such unit. And they confirmed that there was, and he had died in 1960 at the Battle of the Somme. So from that point, Newton, just like Brian Weiss, said, okay, well, if it's curing people, because the guy came, you know, called him the next day, said, my shoulder's fine. My wife wants to thank you. So his, I, the idea was, if it's curing people, what does it matter? So he started seeing more and more patients, and they would go into past life regressions. And then somewhere in the 1960s, he had a patient come in. She was very depressed. Um, she couldn't connect with anybody in her life. And so he asked that question, you know, take me to the source of your pain. But he also added, if, especially if there's a group involved. And as Newton says, it's like a trigger word if there's a group involved because apparently, and as I'll point out, we live between lives with, in groups. Okay? <coughs> so this woman says, oh, I see, I'm with my soul group. I can see them all. And, uh, and we've agreed that in this lifetime we wouldn't be together. I see, okay, I have no problem anymore. And Michael Newton said, what are you talking about? And she said, because under hypnosis, if, has anyone done hypnosis? Yes. So hypnosis is just like meditation. You're never not conscious. Not like quack like a duck stuff you see on stage, you know, that kind of television thing. You're just like being walked through a path, so you're fully conscious of what you're saying and seeing and experiencing, and your conscious mind is saying, are you kidding? I can't believe I'm seeing this. Anyways, she says, it's between lives. I'm with my friends, because Newton is saying, is this in the past? Is this in the future? She says, no, it's now. It's now. They're, I'm with them now. Now, anyone who saw the ending of Lost, you see that yeah. show, Lost? Yeah. Uh, if you did, that whole show took place in what they call now time, life between life stuff. Okay, that's a that's an aside. So 
Newton closed his patent practice because he was so kind of startled by this and he decided that he had to study this. And he closed his public practice and for the next 20 years, he only saw patients and clients who could take him to this place. And there, and then under hypnosis, he grilled them like, you know, uh, like a school teacher to find out the structure of the afterlife. Okay? So he wrote his first book, Journey of Souls, in 1996. It came to me in a very unusual way, which I outlined in the book. But I opened it up, and there the first case was somebody saying, and then in my, you know, between lives, I see that I'm in this classroom, and everyone's dressed in white. <laughs> and they're teaching this class on spirituality. Wow. So I went, oh, okay, this is interesting. So I started to read, and I read he's written three books, four books now. Um, and then I thought as a filmmaker, well, this is an interesting topic. Either this guy's lying, or he's telling the truth, or there's one other possibility that he's got it wrong. So I thought, well, out of those possibilities, I want to find out for myself. So I flew to Chicago where they were doing a conference. This was two years ago. And I, you know, notified them. I said, I'd love to come and interview Michael Newton. And they said, oh, he's retired. But bring your cameras. You can film our conference. And I, really? Oh, that's nice. Okay. So I flew into Chicago. I met Michael. He liked me enough to give me the last interview he said he's ever going to give. So I filmed him for, you know, about an hour. And then I filmed his wife. Because I wanted to know if the things I'd read in his book were accurate. And by asking her these questions, I could, like he said, he never went into a bookshop. From once he started the research, because he was afraid some title of a, of a book would influence his questioning. Because he was so relentless in his questions. And, um, and then they let me film people under hypnosis. And uh, I filmed like maybe a dozen people. And then they said at the end of the conference, why don't you try it? You can film yourself. And I thought, wow, that is a fantastic opportunity for me to disprove this. Very easy. I can sit there. No one's going to guide me and lead me anywhere. And if I don't see anything, I'm going to tell them I don't see a thing. And I'll be danged if four hours later, because these sessions are four hours and five hours long, I went down the same path everyone goes down. 7,000 people over 30 years said the same thing about what happens when we die, where we go, who we see. The process is the same for everyone. Which is? So, which is? You have to read the book. Just kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so that, so it's a synthesis. Because, of yeah. course, as we live our lives, we could say everyone has, we're, bo we're born, we live our life, we die, however that happens, they're, they're the same, but everyone's different. So you have a different shade of experience, but the, the milestones are all the same. And it's this, in a nutshell. And I'll just tell you, here's the process. I'll, I'll give you an example of a four hour session, and then you'll, you'll see what the process is. The first half hour is a sort of deepening thing where they just talk to you, they sort of guide you into a place that seems very comfortable. Might be a beach somewhere, lounging under a tree and then you start to go back into your own life so go back to when you were usually they'll stop around the age of 11 which they did with me and my experience was this is interesting I can see my house as it was in 1966 I can see the car in the driveway the make of the car I can see the car across the street it's that year uh, I remembered cutting my finger and the blood coming out of it I was playing with an axe so I went to this moment, and then I saw my father, who had passed away, in the driveway coming out to help me. And the emotion of seeing him and feeling that he was there, very powerful. Of course, I'm in my own mind. I'm in my own head. It's a memory that I have. I'm just accessing it. So now they go back, 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 down to the, to the earliest time that you can remember. And they said to me, this hypnotherapist said to me, let's go to your first memory. And I said... I'm being born. And I saw in my mind's eye this you know, flash of light, bright light. 
And then as clear as a bell, as clear as I can see your face, I saw this doctor's face looking at me. He had the, you know, the white cap on. He had the, the, that metal thing they used to wear in the 50s. He had the mask here. Hazel eyes, clear as a bell. Now what was weird is that I know he was doing this with his hand. So he's holding me by my feet. But I was looking at him upright. It wasn't like I was looking at him this way. Anyway, I then said, my father's not here. He's on his way here. Now I didn't know that as a detail. Later on I asked my mom after the session, where was dad when I was born? He was driving there. Then they say, let's go back through a tunnel. Let's go down through a stairs, however they say it. And now we're going to go to a previous life that has some profound influence on this life. Um, and I was not going to go there if it wasn't real. So I didn't see anything. And I said, I don't see a thing. And he said, just look down. And when he said that, I looked down and I could see my feet in a cold river. And then as it sort of pulled back and I could see that I was dressed in buckskin and then I could see the feathers in my hair. And I said, <laughs> oh. I'm an American Indian. But I also consciously am going, I'm a screenwriter. I, you know, I know how to write a movie. And then I was like, so I was arguing with myself while I was, but one of the admonitions they say is just don't edit. You can always talk about it later. So I was doing my best not to do that. And then I saw a whole life of this American Indian all the time thinking I'm, you know, dances with wolves. This sign, I said that my name was uh, Watanka. And I thought I was like, Tatanka means bull. Why would I say Watanka? And he said, can we see your tribe? I said, no, they're all, oh, and then I saw that they were all dead. And I opened up a teepee and I saw a woman laying on the ground with her throat cut. And I started to sob and I said, my wife is dead and they've taken my boy. But the emotion was there. And I was thinking to myself, how can I be so connected to this thing if I'm making it up? I was crying. You know, I was feeling it. Like, ugh. Anyway, and so then what they do is they go to the last day of that life, and they, they ask you to describe, describe it. They say, go, let's go to the last day. And so I described killing myself, drowning myself in a big river. And he was there saying, oh, you know, how do you feel about this? And I said, I just want to go home. You know, and as I said it, I was like, What? And then I felt myself racing, and I'm just saying, this is what everyone says, you race back to your home base, and there you're surrounded by your loved ones, and out of a mist came 20 or 30 people, and I recognized somebody stepping forward, this is your, this is my spirit guide, we all have one, they guide us, they help us, they've been with us through all our lifetimes. I recognized them instantly. He was gracious and funny. Uh, and then I'm escorted back, and the first place I went to was a classroom. And there I'm in this classroom, and I just start describing like quantum physics kind of things being taught in this classroom. It's not my discipline. I'm saying things Richard never says. It's all in the book. I'm downloading just chunks of paragraphs. So when I transcribed it later on, I had to, you know, it took me days. What? about energy and energy packets and how past lives travel with us in kind of engrams that are in, in sort of fractals. They're geometric shapes that can contain all the emotional energy of previous lives. I'm saying this. And then I see my father, who had passed away in 2004. There's that emotion. And I saw a good friend of ours, Paul, who died also. They're standing together. I thought, wow, this is so unusual. Even if it's not true, can I just say, even if it's not true, and it's certainly a possibility, you feel it's true. As clear as I'm standing here, you feel that same sensation as those people there. Then there's one other journey that we all take. Besides seeing our loved ones, well, there's a number of other places to go, but one of them is what, what people call the Council of Elders. And it's anywhere from 6 to 12 people. Oh, by the way, your soul group is anywhere from three to 25 people on the average, according to Newton's work. Everybody average is about 15. When you see these people, you recognize them as loved ones from this life. They may even be people who were a stone in your path, but they agreed to play that role. With that soul group, we actually plan our next life together. 
They may play the alcoholic parent because you ask them to. They may play the soldier who kills you because you ask them to, because you want to experience it. They may ask you to play a difficult role in their life. And you, may, you can say no. There's free will. You can say, I, don't, I did the alcoholic father when you were a Viking. I'm not doing it. <laughs> you have permission from yourself whether to do it or not. And then at some point you go to see a council of elders, as they're called, the wise ones, the wisdom makers. Everybody sees them in a different way. Sometimes you see them in a grove. And you'll see in the book, I interviewed numerous people. Each one saw them in a different way. In my case, I saw eight people in front of me, one person speaking. And I was there, and you, you ask a series of questions. And before you do one of these sessions with a Michael Newton trained hypnotherapist, you bring a list of questions if you get this far. So I had 10 questions that, you know, again, I was a skeptic. But I thought, you know, if I get there, I want to be able to ask something. So I had like 10 really profound questions about the nature of reality, the nature of my life, who I am, how I got to be here. And I won't go through them all, they're in the book. But I will go through one, <laughs> which is the most interesting one. Why did I pick Richard Martini? Yeah. And the answer was, every thought, action, word, or deed contains energy. When you write an email, the energy of your heart goes into that email, even if you're not thinking about it, and it affects that other person, sometimes adversely, as we know, sometimes positively, like prayer. But it extends. Every time you paint a painting, the energy that you put into that work exists forever and radiates like an energy pattern throughout the universe and affects people in ways you will never see, but affects their lifetimes. So music, the same way, a song. And you can elevate people's spirits and heal them mm -hmm. by contributing through your work, your art. And in my case, I chose to be a filmmaker because I said, the healing energy that goes into filmmaking can change a person's life. A belly laugh in a theater after you've gone through a tragedy can instantly change where you are on the planet. I said, tears do the same thing. It's just a different process because you have to go through catharsis in order to get to it. But filmmaking was a way that I chose, and I said, in an outside-the-box kind of way, to heal people. And then I said, I'm just not very good at it. And I, I had the experience of seeing everyone laugh, you know, the eight people laughing at that, and the hypnotherapist laughing. So it was like this weird juxtaposition of, of you know, getting laughs on two planes simultaneously. But I also said, I think that's going to change. And then I said goodbye to my dad, and as he kissed me on the forehead, he said, get back to work. <laughs> but I said, one more thing before I come back, and I'm just... The hypnotherapist said, is there anything else you want to experience? And I said, the one message that I want to carry back with me is to just let go. And so now that's resonated with me. To let go of anger, to let go of, of all the stuff that we hold on to that keeps us from being our natural selves. You need to let go of things that are stressing you out, that are causing you grief, you know, revenge, whatever it is, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Let it go. Just let those things go. It's, a, it's an old Buddhist thing, but it's also really, I thought, wow, that's an interesting sentence for me to carry back. So, my journey was then, I was started filming all this stuff, and I was like, what the heck is this? I don't know what this could possibly be, and I was on this Salt movie, and... Uh, an actor that was in the movie said, you know, it sounds like a book to me. And I said, oh, that makes sense. And then I started transcribing it into a book. And I'll just close with one very provocative, but it's kind of proof for me. Because we all sort of experience things in our lives that are of what I'm talking about. And then when you have something to sort of prove it to you, well, my son is six. When he was two, my first phone, my first conversation with him, 
I was in here in Northbrook, and I was talking to him back in Santa Monica, and he said, you know, he's always said, Dad, and I love you, and stuff like that, but his first sentence to me was, Dad, I was a monk in Nepal. Oh. And I was like, put your mother on the phone. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? And she was like, I, I don't know where that came from. And then about a year later, I was in the car with him in Santa Monica, and I was driving around with him, and I thought, well, I'll ask him. So RJ is his name. Did you know Daddy from before? He said, yeah. Where'd you meet Daddy? He said, Tibet. Where in Tibet did you meet Daddy? He said, on the path. Uh -huh. Then I remembered when I was on Mount Kailash in western Tibet with Robert Thurman filming this documentary. Robert said, this is the most sacred spot on the planet, according to Buddhists and Hindus, right here. If you make a wish here, it'll come true. I thought, a million dollars. No? Three-picture deal. I literally was trying to debate, you know, a three-picture movie deal or a million dollars. I said, well, whatever comes out of my mouth, that's my wish. Out of my mouth came, I want a son. Oh. And it was, when I said it, it was like, well, what? Who said that? You know, I had a daughter already. I was, we weren't, I thought it must be a genetic thing, you know. I must, must be a testosterone thing. But now I'm back in the car with him. And I said, do you mean Mount Kailash? And he said, no. So I thought, wow. Oh, that's right. He's very specific. I said, do you mean Kangra? He said, yes, Kangra. Kangra is the name of the path in Tibet that goes around Kailash. Okay, but I said Kangra. So now I'm working on Angelina Jolie's movie. And I'm in this apartment in New York, subletting it. And I'm on the set, and my wife and kids are at the sublet. And RJ goes to the bookshelf, pulls two books out, takes one and throws it in the trash. My wife says, what are you doing? And he says, that book is worthless. This is the important one. Robert Thurman's book, Circling the Sacred Mountain. He flips it open to a picture of where I made the wish, points to it and says, that's where I found Daddy. Oh, home. So my wife called me like, on the set, you know, did you? No, I never said the word Kailash to him except in the car. It gets weirder. Last Sunday, Ow. a week ago Sunday, we were in a store in Topanga Canyon, Tibetan shop, and uh, he, uh, he disappeared. And, you know, they're playing Tibetan music, and I'm talking to the guy behind the counter. And my wife comes up and is like, have you seen RJ? No. So she goes in the back room, and he's standing in front of a mirror doing prostrations. You know, you lay down, put your forehead down, you stand up, your head, your mind, your lips, your heart, lip bending down, doing it over and over and over again. He's never seen anybody do a prostration. And he sees my wife and says, oh, mom, come here. Pulls her down. He says, you need to meditate more. And this is how you do it. And then he said, you hear that music? Every time you hear a chime, there's peace on the planet. And then finally, and I'm looking for a prop, I don't have one, I'll just do it in my hand, but um, the reason I'm home is my mom passed away this past week. So sorry. And you know, 89, she lived a wonderful life, and she's a wonderful person. And so we were discussing with RJ, we're gonna you know, go back to Chicago and Grandma's old and she looks like she's going to pass away. And he grabbed a water bottle, you know, the regular old water bottle, and said, Dad, don't worry. The spirit is wa like water. And then he said, look. And then he threw it on the ground. And then he stomped on it. And he literally was jumping up and down on it. I was thinking, oh my God, he's going to destroy that bottle. Then he gets up off the bottle, he picks it up, and, and it was all crushed and broken. And he said, see, the water's still in there. It's still alive. <laughs> I've never heard life discussed on such a profound level from a six-year-old. So all I can say is these kind of things that happen, it's not about him being a monk. All of our children chose us. The question is why.
We all chose this life that you're leading. The question is why? We all had previous lives. Why? Why did you choose that life? It's not just that you had a life, but you chose it. And there's some connection between that one and why we're here tonight. So, I would be a lot of left. Are we any questions before we get into the rest of the evening? Or just amazing, great story. So the books, uh, it's you know on Kindle, you get a kick out of it. Like I say, it's it's my journey, which I just told you, and then it's transcripts of actual sessions, actual people that I filmed. You know, people, some that I knew, some friends, some studio executives. I just decided I could take anyone off the street if it's true. Mm -hmm. I could take anyone and get the same results. And I have a really well-trained hypnotherapist in LA, really cool guy. Costs about $400 to do this four-hour session. Not too much to see why you're on the planet. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, all I can tell you is everyone has the same experience. And when I... You know, I'm sitting there with my camera filming it, and they get to the point where they say, you know, I'm here with my spirit guide, and he's saying, and I'm thinking to myself, wow, it never gets old to me. It's just a fascinating topic. I highly recommend, if you're interested in the topic, um, the guy who writes the foreword to my book is a Harvard PhD. He was also the head of a Yale Medical School, and he's done a lot of work in, um, in studying psychics. And, and what they're about. But as he puts it in the foreword, because you know Richard's not a scientist by any stretch of the imagination, but sometimes self-science is where great discoveries can be made. What's the name of his book? I, I can't think Sacred of Promise. Sacred Promise. Yeah, yeah, he's got a few. Thank you. That's fascinating. So well, thanks thank to Karen for uh Karen, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. No questions? Go ahead. Come back as animals or vice versa? Great question. According to the research, no. The, each, each sort of creature has their own realm. Creatures of the land, this is the way they, people say. People, uh, creatures of the air, they have their own realm. They, so, like, a bird dies and they can come back as some other creature of the air. You know, a goldfish dies and come back as a whale. Uh, but humans are just. And by the way, this is not the only place we reincarnate. What do you mean? I mean, there's other planets we reincarnate on and other realms. And one of the people I interview uh, in the book says that he normally reincarnates on another planet, but he's here to help raise the consciousness of the planet. And he says that within the next five years, there's going to be some kind of ET-like event that will alter our consciousness in a positive way, not in a negative way, not like 2012, the end of the world. The opposite, that somehow it helps us all come closer together. So a dog couldn't come back as a human? So a dog can't come back as a human, even though my daughter insists that's not true. No, but, uh, no, but dogs, have their own, dogs have their own realm. They can come back as another dog, of course. That's what I mean. There's no yeah, cross-species. But when you're, there's no cross-species. And when you go back there into this netherworld or between life's world, you can hang out with your dog. All the dogs. It's an energy. All the dogs you have. Anybody. Any, anything you want to hang out with, you call their energy to you. And they'll come and hang out with you and play with you. What you know it's hard for people to understand is that you act, it's hard to believe that you would sign up for a certain life. Yeah. Very, all right, so if I can just say, you would sign up for a certain you want to, let me give you one really quick, very controversial thing, and it's very controversial, but it, it's the heart of what this research is. The first person that I filmed here in Chicago, she a hypnotherapist from Sedona, she agreed to do a session in public. I talked to her later. She said she had never had this past life memory. She'd never had this experience. As I set up my camera, she went into this realm, and she remembered being in the gas chamber in Auschwitz. Oh. Oh my she was saying she was naked. Her head was shaved. She was there with these other women. She was trying to comfort them. Now, as a filmmaker, I'm thinking to myself, wow, this is very intense. 
But also, I'm, I'm wondering, is she doing this for my benefit? I don't know, but I, I want to be a skeptic. Then she said, then what they do is they say, well, let's go back to an earlier time in this life where you were happy. She described her family in Warsaw. She named her, her name was Anna Paczynski. She, and she named all of her kids. I was able to find an Anna Paczynski and a few who had died in Auschwitz. But, and this is where it gets really, and it, it really threw me for a loop. Now, he leads her to the last day of her life, and she goes through that experience and sees everybody sort of coming up out of their bodies as spirits and, and returning home. And now we get to this home place, and she's back there, and at some point, she's with her counsel, and she's saying, this, why did I sign up for this life? I don't understand. This was the, so painful. I've lost everyone. And she said this, oh, this is unusual. They're showing me, they're showing me images. I know this is going to sound very difficult, but they're showing me that it was harder to play the role of a perpetrator in this time period than that of a victim. Ooh. When I heard that, my head shot up from the camera. I looked around the room like, where am I? The most politically incorrect thing I've, uncorrect, incorrect thing I've ever heard in my life. Oh, it was harder to be a Nazi? I've never heard such a thing. But then as I heard her talking more and more about it, which she was saying, you know, everyone signs up to play a role. And sometimes people, and she said, they sign up to play a role, but they sort of get out of control. Things go way off a certain area. But... As she said, each day is a test of honor, fidelity, of compassion. You know, we experience the Holocaust on one level as this, of course, unbelievably difficult event. What she was saying that on her day-to-day -day basis, you experience things in a day-to-day -day way with different people being helping or not helping. And you could also say, I mean, just through the research, because there's people, you know, in every country, in Cambodia, in China, and all across the planet, through the many eras we've been through, that have suffered in terrible, terrible ways. And so I had this dialectic argument with a Buddhist monk, who said to me, are you saying that I would sign up to be an HIV baby in Africa, born in, in poverty? Because they believe, you know, that you go... Your past life karma dictates who you're going to be in the future. And I said, which one of those words is a negative? Because when you examine it from a compassionate point of view, and usually they find, this is what they say, is that people who sign up for a difficult role, really difficult role, they're, they're, they're older souls. They feel like they can handle it. Because they have to then bring compassion out of other people, the doctors that are helping them, the nurses that are helping them, the people that are donating. All of that stuff brings out of them, helps them to learn how to be compassionate. Listen, I know it's controversial. I know it's weird. All I can say, that's what the research, that's what people say over and over in the research. That, and also that between lives, there's no hierarchy. It's just younger souls and older souls. We're all equal, and we drop our karmic baggage here when we leave. We go back there, and we're pure and happy and whole and healthy and connected, and we see the healing light of the universe through everybody. And then with our friends, who they report great sense of humor, laughter. You are the one who punishes yourself the most to say, God, I really screwed that up. I really wanted to do those things in my life and I never got around to them and I was going to help people and I didn't do it. And then they tease and mock you and go, oh, come on, don't you remember you did all that stuff for all those other people? And they point things out to you. Anyway, so, go ahead. Okay, can I ask the question of a skeptic? Sure, please, okay. absolutely. In the beginning of your talk, you mentioned the person who recalled his life as a World War One, Yes. Okay, with the pain. And you said that the World War One person passed away in 1960. 1916. Oh, excuse me. That makes up my Yeah, yeah, no, that would be... Okay, so, so, right. Oh, I was saying So what? my head was like, 
my mine was the same way. Is every detail that I would hear in a session, I would then try to research it, back it up, find the case whether it was true or not. I also found in my own research that you know sometimes things didn't pan out exactly as somebody was saying. Myself, I saw myself cutting my finger, but I was cutting the wrong hand. I remembered the wrong hand. When I came out of the session, I went, oh my gosh, that's the scar. But I remembered this finger. So it's like, and let me, let me, I think I understand now why that's the case. Memories of previous lives don't exist within our genetic structure. They're not in our brain. They're not chemical patterns that we've created. According to what people say, they exist almost like energy patterns outside of us. So when we're remembering a past life, you're accessing this thing over here, the memories of it, and translating it through your mind and through your experience. So it, by nature, it would feel foreign, because it is foreign. It's not part of this life. But once you experience it, once you see it, once you go through it, then you own it. You, f you feel it. Go ahead. In response to that, there's a gentleman I see at the health club every day, and he believes in, in everything you're speaking about. And he said that the best thing to do is instead of questioning it, to accept it and just say, that's interesting. And then see how it applies to you later, if it comes back to you later. But just well, to go, that's interesting. Well, in my case, when I, you know, because I'm not, I'm not trying, it's not a philosophy and it's not a religion I'm, I'm trying to espouse here. I'm just saying, this is my, this is my research. Mm -hmm. But when I talk to people about it, and this was fascinating to me, that when you're in a life planning session, you plan with people key moments in your life. Marriage, for example. So when I meet a couple that's married, especially if they had kids, I say, describe to me the moment you met. We did that a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And I've done it so many times that you can actually hear there's an otherworldly moment. You know, uh -huh. people say, I felt like I always knew him. Uh -huh. I felt like I was going to marry him the moment he kissed me. There was something about his voice. It's almost like they're speaking in past tense. One friend saw her husband being interviewed on television and went, that's the man I'm going to marry. Now, he thinks it's because he's cute and funny and charming. Mm -hmm. But she was speaking in past tense, an event that she already knew was going to occur. You hear it all the time in your life. And what I'm saying is those are not random events. No, no, I don't have a question. Oh, <laughs> you're just stretching. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, this may be off this topic, but, okay, for instance, someone coming back to you with a sign or you hear someone who's passed. Yes. Is that a possibility? Absolutely. Here's the thing. We don't die. Our physical bodies do, but our energy... It's been around. It's a quantum physics thing. Energy doesn't die. It goes other places. But people aren't aware that it's concentrated in a conscious way. So, and here's what a friend of ours um, had a session, mutual friend. He remembered being a young girl dying in Dachau. He was so um, scarred by the experience. During the session, he said, it was like my skull, my soul had been scorched. And in the, ca the course of the, the uh, session, he said that his, the, the hypnotherapist said, is there any way we can help you? And he said, I need to go to the river of souls. But he said, out of you know, nowhere. And then he, he walked into a river and he felt this wound being washed away from him. It was very profound. But at the end of the session, you know, the hypnotherapist said, anybody want to see next? And he said, I want to see my mom. And so his mother appeared, very strong persona. And she said, son, when you need to contact me, it works just the way a cell phone works. Because a cell phone, we don't know why a cell phone works. We, have, we can't see the waves. We just know that if we push these buttons, we'll reach our loved one. And we put it to our ear, and we can feel the emotion and hear our loved one's voice. My cousin was here in Chicago three days ago. His mom died last year. He knows I'm talking about this stuff. He pulled me aside. He said, I had the weirdest dream last night. He said, I was in a room full of people. And all these people were partying. And somebody on the other side of the room said, Coin, that's his name. 
The phone's for you. He was like, what? Who's that? Telephone. And he walked over, picked up the extension, listened. It was his mother's voice. It's clear as a bell. How you doing, coin? Just the way she talked. Well, I'm fine, Mom. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? That's the way she talked. And just the intonation and everything. And then he said, suddenly the line went dead, and he put the phone down, and everyone had disappeared. Oh, God. But that's the way communicating with someone. So they, the easiest way for them to enter, to give you a message, is to enter a dream. Because they can match your energy and your dream, and they can place themselves in your dream. So when you have a dream that seems profound, please don't ignore it. Write it down. Ask people around you, does this mean anything to you? It might be for somebody else. You hear a message, you hear a word, lottery numbers, please call me. <laughs> but you hear something, don't ignore it. You can't ignore it, of course. Maybe it's not your destiny to know about this stuff. That's very possible. But write it down, see if it has any resonance with you. My father passed away in 2004. I've told my brothers this story. They look at me cross-eyed. But the night he passed, I felt his hand on my shoulder. He woke me up and he said, I'm experiencing indescribable joy. So the next morning I said to my mom, you know, did you ever hear him say, talk like that? No, very rarely, but he, that was a word he used about something that was so beautiful. The next night, he woke me again. Dad, you're waking me up. And he said, I need you to write something down. Now, I'm hearing it, like, here. Okay. Turn the light on, get the paper, pencil. I, you know, turn the light off. Is he still there? Yes. I'm here with, I'm here with, and he named all these people, many of whom I never heard of. My mom knew who they were. Uh, I love you, blah, 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 blah. It's beautiful here. And then, I need you to write a note to your brothers. And to each brother... They got a note from him. I, I didn't understand what the note meant. Didn't mean to me. And then I said to him at the end of this kind of profound thing, why are you talking to me? And he said, because you can hear me. So all I can say is, you know, I could have made it up. It's very possible. The notes were pretty specific to each of them. They understand them. I don't. And all I can say is just pay attention to this kind of stuff because it's... Uh, it's there for a reason. And that's it. All right, thank you. All right. And now I get my glass of wine and listen to the rest of it. <laughs>